Welcome to RxXR, a medical and rehab think tank where we discuss the latest ideas and approaches to making a better world for us all. In today's session, we are joined by three amazing medical engineers, Drew, Mitch, and Jared. Today's topics will include quad stick tips and tricks, Sony Access Controller and the Zac, one-handed joystick, Able Gamers, Walking VR, Quest 3, and more. Let's begin. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, RXXR, and we're going to be doing a roundtable. Uh, I'm really excited about this co uh, conversation, and we have uh, a few guests, and I'm going to go through those guests in just a minute. My name is Randy Uzenik. I'll be moderating tonight, and uh, Jeff Rayner is our co-host. Jeff, you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Hey, everybody. Jeff Rayner here. I run Mixed Reality, a company out of Seattle, Washington, and one of our specializations is in helping people wherever we can with XR. Great, Jeff. Thanks. So let's just uh, jump over to a screen share and we'll get going. We're going to go through a little bit of a roundtable discussion with uh, some rehab engineers that we have on board tonight. And I want to welcome uh, Jared Greer, uh, Drew Redenpenning, and Mitch Bell. But uh, first, we want to talk a little bit about uh, up and coming events and some hardware. And Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what's uh, currently here and what's uh, exciting right now? Yeah, I think the big news since the last session is the update or the, the the updates that come along with the announcement of the Quest 3, which is now publicly available. So this is Meta's third Quest, which is a standalone headset and can be used via a cable or, or Wi-Fi via something called AirLink to any computer. So you get the best of both worlds. Uh, and... I got to say, it's it's pretty mind blowing the capabilities that they've managed to squeeze into this device, and managed to make it smaller than the Quest Two, a lot more powerful, and with a lot more features and functions. To go through a few of the things that I think will really make a difference in the rehab world and the RX world, as it were, is one, it has an amazing pass through camera. So that pass through camera basically is you can see on that picture there. There's two cameras that, that point forward, and it is full color. That is perfect, in my opinion, for people who are new to VR, because you can start the world in your real world, and you know, put the headset on, and you still see the real world. And then you can fade that into either a mixed reality, where you essentially augment the world around you with some, some interesting things. And then you can fade that into full virtual reality. So you get with this one headset, a complete combination of augmented, virtual, and mixed. It's kind of like, what more can you get out of that? The other thing that it brings is a lot more sensors and cameras. So that means your hand tracking, your feet tracking uh, are amazing, actually, I got to say. So again, for rehab purposes, it's it's really, a, it used to have to buy all these different sensors. Now, potentially, these have been I wouldn't say made redundant, right? Obviously, anything with those sensors works, but even without them, you can get some base tracking straight out the gate. The other thing to note is it's much more comfortable. It actually, despite being a lot smaller and narrower and fitting on your head a lot more comfortably, it weighs about the same, which is a little bizarre, but it just fits your head that much easier. You don't have to adjust all of the, the IPD and the sensors hardly as uh hardly ever actually because it's close to your face and so you just get a better view you do have an adjustment for glasses so uh you can just press some buttons on the inside and push it forwards it, it means it's really convenient really comfortable a lot more adaptable and that's just on the hardware side on the kind of usability side it has increased graphics better quality rec uh, renders of the textures of lighting or shadows it has increased the frame rate dramatically in a lot of experiences. So all in all, it's an amazing headset. It's 499 is the base cost. Uh, it's my go-to headset right now. And I think it will be for you know the areas that we're talking about here today as well. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Anything else you'd like to share? There's definitely some stuff coming. 
Um, but we'll save that for the next time. So, the, you know, I think this is the biggest news of the last few months. But as we know, Christmas is approaching. And with Christmas comes uh, potentially a lot more announcements. I think a lot of companies have been waiting for this to come out before they announce what they're going to do. We also know early next year, the Apple headset is supposed to be launched. Whether that will meet the deadline, we'll see. Um, but there's no specific date, to the best of my knowledge, yet. That obviously is a, this is a headset. The AVP is essentially a computer with a headset on your face, and it is five times the price. So we've got big expectations for that, but we'll see if it lives up to them. Great. Thanks, Jeff. So as far as events are concerned, uh, the American Medical Extended Reality Association is starting a, a new journal. It, they do not have uh, a initial uh, edition, but they're uh, working on submissions at this point in time. And, it's, and the, uh, the journal is going to be called uh, the Journal of Medical Extended Reality. And that should be up and coming within the next quarter or so. In uh, addition to that, uh, the only uh, uh, update I have as far as uh, medical VR conferences are concerned is the VMED, which is going to be held in Los, uh, excuse me, uh, Los Angeles, uh, March 28th through uh, the 29th. And there's going to be a lot of great speakers there, uh, such as uh, Skip Rizzo and uh, Greenleaf. Uh, so it's always worth uh, checking that out. That's going to be at the Sofia Hotel in Los Angeles. And uh, if you go on to uh, virtualmed.org, you can find that information. So I want to jump right to our guests. And thanks a lot for agreeing to uh, uh, talk about your your job and, your, and uh, share some information about rehab engineering. And our first guest is uh, Jared Greer, and he's a rehab engineer uh, specializing in assistive technology, adaptive gaming, and custom device fabrication. He serves in the inpatient, outpatient spinal cord injury and brain injury population at Shepherd Center. And I should mention that everyone is strictly representing their own uh, viewpoints and strictly theirs alone. Uh, so, uh, please take that into consideration. The next engineer is Mitch Bell. I have the pleasure of working with Mitch directly. Uh, Mitch is a rehab innovation specialist at UPMC and has a master's in rehabilitation and assistive technology. And our last guest is Drew uh, Redenpenning. Drew is currently in a uh, PM&R uh, residency right here at UPMC, and he's a bioengineer and, and a certified assistive technology specialist who's been involved in the field of adaptive gaming for over five years. So we're going to jump right into the uh, discussion, and uh, I'm going to start by just asking our, our guests what a typical day looks like uh, when they're uh, involved in rehab engineering. And I'm going to start with uh, Jared, if you don't mind. Yeah, happy to uh, <clears throat> kind of talk about my experience. So as a rehab engineer at the Shepherd Center, I've got a background in mechanical engineering. Um, I also carry with me a lived experience of a spinal cord injury that does aid in some of the work that I do. Um, but I function within our assistive technology center, um, which is comprised of a few different sub-departments, including our seating clinic for evaluations for individuals, uh, newly or returning patients. Um, we have our driving clinic, which assists in evaluations and certification for individuals to either continue driving or determine what equipment they need to uh, drive again after an injury. Uh, and then we have our uh, assistive technology lab where we have just about one of every kind of assistive tech item out there that gives our patients the ability to demo trial um, and figure out what's going to work best for them um, before they have to worry about trying to buy anything or figure it out for themselves. And my role within that department is basically to assist all of those um, sub-departments by solving problems, fabricating devices. Um, I'm the go-to for adaptive gaming. So very often I'll be doing co-treats with our uh, assistive technology therapist um, and some other individuals. Um, 
And then outside of the function of that department, I also am available for all of our therapists across the center, both the spinal cord injury and the brain injury uh, departments. And very often I'll be doing co-treats with a therapist and their uh, patient and determining, you know, what's the goal, what is the task they'd like to uh, achieve. And I will design and fabricate some device to help get there. So a lot of 3D printing and some custom fabrications in our workshop, um, but kind of a all over the place, help out everywhere I can as, as the needs arise, so. Great, thanks, Jared. Uh, Mitch, do you mind uh, taking a little snapshot of what your day looks like as a rehab engineer? Sure. And my background in undergrad, I did rehab science. So I was on a pre-PT or OT track. And then I learned about assistive technology. And growing up, I was a huge gamer, still am, and liked playing with technology, building computers. So I found this career path. And at UPMC now, I work outpatient and inpatient, mostly inpatient for assistive technology with Randy on spinal cord injury and then over at Children's Hospital. And if any of the therapists have a patient that might need assistive tech, computer, smartphone, or gaming access, they'll reach out and then we'll do a co-treat and work to see, you know, what kind of games they like to play, what technology they want to use. And then we'll have them try out a lot of the assistive technology, provide them resources, whether it's grants, funding, or different programs they can do once they leave the hospital. And we can set them up to visit on the outpatient side again. So some of the treatments that we do are either just regular ot activities but we'll try to use a video game in virtual reality or adaptive controllers or just in the patient's free time if they want to play some games we're around to help set them up thanks mitch and drew do you want to share a little bit about your experience as well yeah and my uh my experience has changed uh pretty significantly over the last few years just because um I initially started as an assistive technology specialist where I did a little bit of everything in the area of assistive technology. Since then, my time is a little bit more limited since I'm more in the medical area, but um, the primary areas that I kind of focus in or, or my primary areas of interest are uh, adaptive video gaming and uh, environmental controls. So uh, I still work with a lot of people, primarily uh, like remotely back in Minnesota um, and also around here as well to help them play video games again, help them connect equipment. Um, and I also do a lot of informational videos on how to set up adaptive gaming equipment. Uh, and I'm always kind of looking at learning and trying to figure out how to best connect and best adapt as new equipment comes out as well. Uh, so, uh, and then I work a lot on the inpatient side of things too with, a, with assistive technology, trying to find how to make the hospital rooms more accessible through adaptive technology, through making custom devices, uh, and then also how to make people's homes more accessible too. So I do a lot of remote work primarily now, but uh, it's kind of changed quite a bit over the last few years now that I'm more in the, the medical side of things. Great. And uh, I know that you're uh, first year medical, is that correct, Drew? Yeah. And. Can you tell me if there's been any crossover at all between those two worlds so far? Yeah, there's there's a pretty significant crossover. Actually, uh, I get a lot of people who um, I'm in the neuro ICU right now, and uh, a lot of the people coming through are uh, individuals who eventually are going to go into the to the rehab area afterwards. And I get some gamers coming through too, and I get to kind of talk to them about. Uh, the different options that are available for assistive technology and it's kind of uh it's it's cool seeing all aspects of and all stages of that of that kind of cycle because those individuals are at a completely different stage in the rehab stage but um being able to get to them so early and talk to them about all the hope that's out there and all the things that's available for them to be able to do things independently still even after a significant spinal cord injury or brain injury great thanks drew i really appreciate it so I'm going to jump right into the weeds, and I know that this device is not out there yet, but uh, I know that we've all been looking forward to it, and it's the PlayStation Access. And I know that uh, we've sort of been picking, uh, picking the bones as far as the little pieces of information that we're getting, 
And we hate to jump the gun, but uh, let's talk about it a little bit. Are people excited about it? And what have you found out about it? And, and uh, how do you think it's going to impact uh, accessible gaming? I know a lot of people are are, are really, really excited about uh, the PlayStation. And uh, they love the Xbox. And we've had a lot of experience with the Xbox. But let's talk a little bit about uh, the PS. Anybody want to start with that? I, I can jump in and, and talk about it a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I was pretty, really excited to hear that uh, PS5 is coming out with a new adaptive controller because, um, as we all kind of know on on this uh, call right now, is PlayStation's been really kind of hard to crack as far as finding adaptive controllers to interface with, uh, especially the P when the PS5 came out. A lot of people who were using PlayStation controllers who used adaptive controllers couldn't interface with it, uh, and their adaptive controllers wouldn't work. So I was really excited to see that PS5 is now getting into the area of accessibility, and they're coming out with new accessibility features that are actually built in to the PS5 itself. Um, I think one a couple of really nice things that are built into this device is there seems to be more a, a couple more things on the software side, like being able to program multiple button functions into just a single button. So if somebody needs to hold down two buttons at the same time, they can do that with a single button. And also things like toggle, so someone doesn't have to keep holding down a button when they're playing. So I think building more things into the software side of things, um, and uh, rather than the hardware side of things, is is really important because those little kind of tricks on the software side of things can help people really be able to play games independently. Great. Thanks, and why don't uh, you give a quick little overview of? like what the PlayStation access is, because I think a lot of people don't really even have an idea of, of what it is and how it works and how it's different from anything else. And Randy, uh, if you can, do you want to pull up a picture in the background? Yeah, I'll try to do that. Uh, I'd be happy to kind of talk a little bit about it. Um, at its core, it's a more easily accessible uh, controller um, currently, and you'll see in the picture, but it has a ring of a number of different uh, swappable uh, buttons that correspond to the standard PlayStation 4 control, PlayStation 5 uh, controller buttons, along with a uh, joystick that both can move telescopically in and out away from that ring and can have uh, different heads of that joystick swapped out. So you can have a ball or like a goal post or something. Um, and it seems as though it's going to work best for some people with two of them side by side, uh, kind of simulating where you'd be having two joysticks and all your buttons. Um, I think the, from what I've seen, uh, one of the nice benefits of this controller in contrast to the XAC controller is that it comes already with your joystick, your buttons, like you're ready to go. You're not having to buy that hub and then and find all your switches and joysticks and stuff. So I think I find that as a positive. However, the hardware is stuck in a form factor already. So there's that other issue of like, okay, it's there, but there's only one way to get to it. So if you know you're limited in other abilities, you know, or you know, your reach from the joystick to the ring, it might be a little bit tougher. Now they do have, I believe there's four switch ports so you can add your you know additional switches if you really you know need it play somewhere specific but it's kind of there's a trade-off there between what the xac and this adaptive controller you know has feature wise what i but, appreciated about the uh, playstation sorry i jumped on jumped in a little late in the meeting but um i was really excited about the playstation access controller coming on what i appreciated about their design is that it's they came at the problem from the complete opposite end as the X Xbox did. Xbox said, okay, working with therapists, they realized there's not going to be a one size fits all solution for any sort of adaptive setup. So they kind of went with the modular um, setup, which they gave me the ports and then they let the clinicians figure out uh, or the, you know, the adaptive gaming specialist or the clinician or the engineer figure out kind of the ins and outs and the setup and which I really appreciated about Xbox. But then with PlayStation, when they when I heard the rumors of an adaptive controller coming out, I thought, oh, they're just I mean, I appreciate it because there there's competition. So it's forced these other big companies to come out with a device. And I wondered, oh, is this going to just be another Xbox adaptive controller? Or are they just going to copy what they did? But I really, really appreciated they came in from the other end and that 
one box, you open it up, it already comes with buttons. And so um, you, and I, I do think that um, out of the box, a lot of users that, that still have upper extremity mobility would be able to kind of finagle one controller and then access a game. Um, Cause for most of my clients, either you're using a mouth joystick or a variation of buttons in addition to the joystick. Um, so I do think that they obviously out of the box, you're not going to have one size fits all, but if they're going to come out with a design that gives you a bunch of buttons, um, then I think that they did a pretty good job of coming up with a cir circular design and that joystick. I, I really love that they gave you a joystick because with the Xbox adaptive controller, when the, the PDP one-handed uh, joystick became not available anymore, I, I basically have been kind of holding onto my one joystick and using it with my patients um, and like hoping that it doesn't die. I had two and then one died. And so I'm just holding on to one and there isn't a good joystick option. So the fact that they gave us the joystick out of the box, I thought that that was really, really awesome. I'm so glad you're on tonight. Uh, so I, I saw the, the, the engineer yeah. here. <laughs> yep. Do you want to go ahead and jump in and just introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sung Hee. Um, I work as a rehab engineer at uh, Michigan Medicine, so I'm at University of Michigan. Um, I wear a lot of hats at University of Michigan. So by day, my role is probably really similar to um, Jared and Mitch's role as a you know clinician working individually with patients on computer access, cell phone access, all that stuff, and then co-treating with therapies and adding in gaming for their therapeutic goals. I also run an adaptive gaming program that was recently funded. Oh, so Randy, um, the pro the program that Rob and I have been trying to get funded. Oh, wait, actually, Jeff, you're on the on the grant. You're creating the VR program for us. So. Uh, Craig Nielsen funded a two-year uh, grant for us. Our program's name's called IMPART, and it stands for Improving Access to Rehab Technologies. And um, part of that is we're running, it's basically all about adaptive gaming. And so part of that, we have community rehab arcade nights every other month, and then we have funding to equip an entire evaluation lab and then pays for some of my time so that I can go and evaluate patients and then set them up and we have funding set aside for super users. That's what we're calling our users that get evaluation time from me and then all of their equipment down to the console all, all paid for. So their whole adaptive gaming setup paid for. I wear um, that hat for adaptive gaming at, at Michigan Medicine. I also run an adaptive sports program and then a, mod a Tinker Toy Box, which is a um, switch modified toy holiday drive uh, program that I run every year. So all the any sort of AT kind of related things. Um, I'm also on the board of directors at Resna. So I have my ATP and my RET through Resna, and then currently on the board. So all I, I'm surprised. I don't think that I've ran into any of you guys. So I was really surprised when the um, agenda came out when Randy sent the agenda. I was like, wait, there are more people like me out there. <laughs> There's more of us out there. So I knew I, I had to jump on. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm glad you could uh, attend. Yeah. That's great. Randy, just quickly as well, it's worth noting a couple of you mentioned the Xbox adaptive controller, the Zach, and the additional accessories. Just a few months ago, we did have Bryce Johnson on actually going over all of those. And so uh, we'll put a link in the description to that awesome. talk as well. Uh, the price is about $100 or $90, I think, for the Sony mm -hmm. version, right? So then right in the same ballpark, too. Yeah. And on we the did Sony order a couple for pre-order. I think the pre-order is available. That is yeah, correct. I think the, mm -hmm. the key thing, though, is you know, it's it's about 90 bucks for the one half of a controller, though. Uh, for the PlayStation Access controller versus... You think that You think that you would need two joysticks for most setups? I mean, maybe your gamers are way more advanced. I feel like yeah, most I of the games that so, I set up, it just need one. So my goal when I worked with patients in adaptive gaming, those who are super interested in gaming and who were gamers, oh, is okay. to get them back to playing games as mm. most effectively as they can. And so we're talking like getting their APM actions per minute up as high as possible. If you're playing a first-person shooter, you need both joysticks. 
you know, I, I shoot for the stars. And so I bought, I pre-ordered two of those because I knew I'd need to one hand on both. And, and you had mentioned it too, Song Hee, but it seems like it's really going to be great for those low cervical injury patients who've got Mm the arm function, but the limited hand dexterity, -hmm. it's definitely the individuals who I'm going to try first. Um, but I think there's benefit elsewhere too. I mean, you could have one of those paired with a standard controller. Um, I know a lot of gamers who play that way where they'll have their Xbox controller and then use the Zach for some auxiliary buttons like triggers they can't get to, but mm -hmm. it'll be exciting to have. And just the fact that I don't have to turn down people who want to play on PlayStation 5 anymore will be really nice. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm in the same boat too. Um, I agree because it's like, when I'm working with people, I want to be able to get them to play at like a extremely high level. And I think that's where a lot of these controllers are lacking is like I said, the software side of things like the quad stick is by soft on the software side is the best device on the market by far. Cause I can program whatever I want to that device, any button, any mapping, any way I want to do it. I can program how the button functions when somebody presses it in the game. So the quad stick only has one joystick, but I can program so much into it that someone can play two joystick games and I, I can program all these little tricks in and map them onto the quad stick. So I wish some of these controllers had better software and better programming capabilities. Obviously that makes it more complicated on the user's end to set up, but it allows the gamer to really game at a really high level. Um, but I think going back to the PS5 access controller, I think uh, one thing it just does is just give some, us, us another option to provide to people. Um, I think a, a common misconception a lot of people have is that now that the PS5 controller come out, came out, now that's the only controller people can use on the PS5 and the Xbox controller is the only, Xbox adaptive controller is the only one you can use on the Xbox. Um, but there's a lot of ways to get these controllers to work on the other consoles. Like I can get the Xbox adaptive controller to work on the PS5. I can get the quad stick to work on any console. Um, using something called like an adapter and it tricks your console into thinking your controller is for that console. So um, all of these different controllers can be used on any of the consoles. Uh, so I think this just gives us another option to provide to people no matter what uh, console they game on. So do you I think did... these devices actually compete with each other or are they serving different purposes? Different. I think they're, di they're completely different yeah. devices. Yeah, I, I don't even... Is that like looking at the device? I don't know specifically what type of user would benefit most. I just think going through like the assessment process, working with people, it's just another completely different option. I do think that it might be more consumer friendly. Somebody who, because that I think that was the comp, the, like the early on when the Zach came out, people thought you could just out of the box, any like gift it to somebody that has a disability and say, oh, hey, game now. You can game, you can, you can start gaming now. But it was that wasn't the case. And I feel like maybe with the PlayStation access controller, you can gift it to somebody that might be interested in gaming, but they can't use standard controls. And that'll be a starting point. At least there are some buttons and then they'll know what they are missing. If if none of those buttons work in that circle and they need all of that move all of them moved elsewhere, I think that somebody would be able to figure that out from starting from the access controller. Whereas from the Zach. You can't even set it up from the get-go so you won't even know oh why they wouldn't know why they still can't access the game whereas with the playstation access control i think that at least they'll be able to visualize oh i may be able to game but here are some tweaks that we need to make one thing i wanted to kind of jump off of what Drew had said, and both as a question for myself to y'all, but also as a talking point, because I think and this is very recent. I'm not sure how many of you saw, but Microsoft recently announced that they're going to be excluding third-party controllers from that. And in my experience, PlayStation 5, I was under the assumption had already had that. And I, when I tried to do X, the Zach on PlayStation 5 with a Brook converter, it would work on the home screen, but you go to launch a game and it says, you know, non, you know, non supported controllers detected, mm -hmm. you can't play. And so, you know, we're talking at Shepard, myself, and some of the other AT therapists do gaming. You know, once Microsoft releases this update, is that going to nix the quad stick? You know, what is it going to look like for those people who aren't trying to play with the Zach? I'm not sure what y'all thoughts are. We need Bryce back on. 
<laughs> to ask him these questions. Right. I think one of the <laughs> things I saw when like the Xbox controller came out is that Xbox said any system can use this. PlayStation can use this if they want to. And PlayStation was a little more secure and says they need to like fix these security issues and we'll allow it on the system. Now that PlayStations is coming out, I really hope the next step is that they both work out that agreement where they will be compatible with each other's systems. Because the Xbox One, it just has to be licensed or approved by Xbox to work. So they could work something out behind the scenes where that does happen. Now that Xbox isn't holding kind of the exclusive console adaptive controller, I'm wondering if they'll be more likely to accept that because like you've all mentioned that the Sony one's very good to just give to someone and they'll figure it out. And then the adaptive controller is great for people who need a lot more customization. And I was, I was pretty upset when Xbox came out with that update because like the Chrono Zen is the cheapest and e I mean, the uh, Brook converter is the cheapest and easiest way to get these adaptive controllers connected. Um, so going like the PS5, the Chrono Zen actually came out with an update this year and you can actually use the Xbox adaptive controller using the Chrono Zen on the PS5 now. Um, and it's been pretty consistent and it, you, you're able to use pretty much any controller or any adaptive controller on the PS5 using the Chrono Zen adapter. It is more complicated to set up than a Brook converter though. Um, and then there's one and other. And it takes converter. up a controller, right? You have to have one plugged in the whole time. You, yeah. The only okay. way to do it on PS5 is it, there's two options. There's the Brook converter, and then there's the B Savior. Um, they came out with a new one called the U5 as well. That's all local. Doesn't require any remote play. Um, that one also requires a PS5 controller. Um, this new update by Xbox, it it affects the Brook converter, but it might it most likely won't affect uh, the Chrono Zen because the Chrono Zen uses like a pass-through controller. So you plug a controller into it and it uses that controller as the authentication. So it really thinks there's a real Xbox controller plugged in. I think, you know what, there, uh, we set up an Xbox very recently, the Xbox um, X. And I think it did have all the most recent updates put onto the device. And I think I remember, um, with the Cronus, the setup was different. So I think I think you were right, Drew, your kind of assumption about Cronus Zen being maybe the only one that would allow yeah. you to access the Xbox, the newer ones. Yeah, and, and with the, the updates. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate because it's like twice as expensive and it's more complicated to set up because someone obviously using adaptive controller is gonna have a difficult time plugging things in. You have to plug in a controller and you have to go through all these steps with the Brook converters just it, it just kind of plug and play. It's really simple. So um, it, that's kind of on for that was pretty bummed. Hopefully Xbox works through and changes some things to let some of these uh, other converters work because it really just kind of impedes a lot of people whose adaptive controllers ability to play on the Xbox now. And now I think with everything coming out, I think I've told people is PlayStation's now used to be the complete, like completely much lower than Xbox and accessibility. And now PlayStation's kind of catching up, I feel like, with all these things happening. That's really uh, another question for you guys then. Does anyone know if this is going to be compatible with their VR setup as well? I don't know if it's been announced I, yet. I've, I've been looking on. everywhere in their terms to see if they've said it yet. I have not. Um, I do play a couple games that you use a regular controller for VR. So I'm hoping it works for that. And just in my personal experience, I can't use the triggers on my left hand for the PSVR 2. So I'm hoping that with that adaptive controller, I could put a switch somewhere that I could activate. Um, if not, I hope that's something easy enough for them to patch in. Related to that, I don't know if you guys saw Quest actually, sorry, Meta just recently announced that the Quest 3 is going to support Xbox gaming. So in theory, what that means, you through your Xbox account, you can log in and play your Xbox games straight on the Quest from anywhere, which is oh, so that wild. means that with head movement, I would assume well, it's more of just a virtual screen in the VR. Yeah, it, it. okay. It's, with, a, okay. it's a virtual screen and a virtual console in the fact that you're basically plugging into the web, a web version of streaming, your Xbox. Yeah, it's like streaming Got the game. Okay. Yeah. Now, kind of like cool virtual is, desktop. Kind of, yeah. Okay. Uh, to be honest, it's not fully announced yet. Uh, the other thing Crazy about it is, 
you can connect an Xbox controller to it. So it's also possible, we'll see if it comes true, that you'll be able to connect the ZAC to it as well, which is fantastic if that is the case. And then possibly even more accessible controllers because then it opens up VR. As we know, VR is a little tricky for many people with disabilities. But if we start to have all of these supported peripherals, it opens it all up. And fingers crossed PSVR will do the same. Uh, Mitch, I, I know that you have a, a few or at least one trick of the trade as far as accessibility is concerned with the uh, the PSVR 2. And that is the uh, the sort of like their version of Copilot, for lack of a better term. Do you want to share that with uh, uh, the folks? For PSVR 2, you were saying? Yeah. Is is that correct? Or am I? I don't, yeah, I don't know if they tested that yet but playstation is adding or already has added copilot to the system hardware now so you can play with the regular controller and then their new access controller or just two regular playstation controllers um that was i think when we were talking i wanted to test using that uh, in the with the vr controllers to see if i could press the left trigger on the playstation controller instead of the vr controller have you noticed anything uh, other than that in the PS uh, uh, VR2 as far as accessibility features are concerned? I think one of the big ones that it depends on the game you play, you can use eye tracking for navigating menus and selecting and they have the game again has like dwell to click on things and more games are adding in just general accessibility settings and with some of the VR games, you either have free motion where you can use the joystick to move around or teleportation where you look somewhere and then click a button and you just jump to that spot. And so I'm thinking that eventually we'll catch up with some more accessibility features for VR where instead of having to use the motion controllers, you could use a standard one or some switches and change how you play the game. Great, thanks. Any other uh, tricks of the trade that uh, people may want to share as far as VR is concerned, uh, commercial VR specifically? Uh, is anybody using uh, the uh, walk in VR overlay and how are they using it or and any other viewpoints from that uh, software? I've used it previously um, to just offset you know, the positioning of the VR setup and for different limb lengths and also to accommodate for users that can't sit up all the way. Mm -hmm. um, not extensive experience with it, but just kind of the standard way of using the walk-in VR. But I think, did they start charging to use walk-in VR? So there's three different modes right now. The first mode is free, and then they they have uh, obviously some um, interjected commercials in it. Uh, the second one is intended for uh, the consumer. And I believe the last time I looked, and please do not quote me on this, it's somewhere around $6 a month, and there's okay. no commercials in that. The last mode is for the organizations, hospitals, et cetera, universities, and that is $120 a month. So it's uh, it's quite pricey. I've used it quite, uh, quite a bit uh, with uh, uh, patients that have a, a hard time really getting into position for using the uh, controllers, uh, the commercial controllers. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if they if they can't supinate their or, or pronate their hand or they can't extend their elbow, I will use that to adjust it so they can play with uh, certain games such as Beat Saber and so forth. And it, and and I, I find it uh, worthy of that price. Um, but um, I was hoping that somebody else would come in there and sort of integrate that technology uh, sooner, but uh, <laughs> they have not. Uh, so I'm continuing to uh, advocate for that uh, uh, that su subscription, um, and I use it occasionally as well. Yeah. Well, Jeff, aren't you working on something for <laughs> us? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we're allowed to share just yet. I mean, there's a couple okay. of things to note. One is 
Uh, the Greg has been another guest on our show in the past. Um, actually, that was before we publicly pushed the videos. Uh, but we we might want to either relook into sharing that, uh, and or we we could get Greg back on and get an update from him. So on that side, yeah, that's the way that is. The to your other comment though, yeah, the the stuff we're doing is is obviously some some things are similar. There's definitely some overlap, but Walking VR does it a fantastic job of having a lot more applicability, where versus what we're trying to work on is more of the trackability right mm-hmm. for and that data analysis and stuff to actually understand the rehab side of it but yeah and i get i think actually that would be perhaps a good session to get you back on to actually explore and talk about that sounds good <laughs> great uh getting back into uh gaming again uh does anybody have any uh tricks that they'd like to uh integrate into this conversation as far as how they're currently using the Zach or any other devices that may not be typical. And we, we all know that it is individual to the uh, the user, but something that might be a little bit broader. Uh, any tricks of the trade that you want to share? I've used the, again, my favorite joystick, the PDP one-handed. Um, Logic Tech made joystick. I've used that both for hand control as well as mouth control just by mounting it. And then I've 3D printed an extension that slides onto the joystick. And what I found was that the joystick of that, the one-handed controller, one-handed nunchuck looking joystick is the same dimension as an Xbox controller. So with the same 3D printed file, I can slide it under the joystick and just kind of pressure fit it in there. Um, and I have used it with both patients that you like to use their chin for their joystick control or um, with their mouth. So depending on how they like to use it or mounting it near somebody's hand, just use it as a standard kind of hand joystick. So I feel like that's been really, really versatile for me regardless of what the patient's using or the gamer's using as far as joystick movements. But I have yet I, to find any other joysticks. There's a, the ones that are similar to like the PDP one-handed joysticks. Um, I think Warfighter that, Engage. Warfighter I know, Engage but they, they're they out. The Warfighter Engage okay. is way behind. Seven, and Jeff, seven are, you, mile, are you? There's an what? Etsy channel that sells some uh, Seven Mile yeah. Mountain. Um, seven mile sell, mountain yeah it's like an etsy company i can even put it in the chat um but it's a company they also sell those same ones like the nunchuck uh based ones uh but it's some guy he he, he has some interesting stuff on there too that might be helpful for some other people as well i've bought and, i've purchased some things from him in the past that's great to hear drew because yeah to the best of my knowledge They've stopped making these now. They did. Right? And it's Which a is, tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> and But about those joysticks, what I really always hated was that those two buttons on the joystick, they're an up and down arrow, like the, um, the D-pad controls. So the top one is just the joystick being pushed up, and then the bottom one is joystick being pushed down, and there's no way to program it to do anything else. And... Um, just intuitively when I set somebody up, they, they, the gamer usually presses that those buttons thinking that it's like the A button or the B button or whatever the trick, whatever the main, um, control that you need, but that's So I might be wrong, but I believe you can, if you plug this into an adaptive Xbox controller, you Uh can use the software for the, uh, re-controller or whatever it's called to actually change what the buttons do. Really? I think I've it's tried that. X, X1 and X2 on the like profile customization on Xbox and PC. But the X1, X1 and the X2 is the entire joystick in one jack, though. It is, but if you have that plugged in just to the USB and nothing plugged into X1 and X2, uh-huh. and you change those button programs, then it works for that. Got it. Yeah, that's... But they don't explain nice. that at all. It's not, no, not easy it's not, to find out. And then also, like, if 
if you know a little bit about what the exponent x to do like I, like me i i wouldn't have investigated mm -hmm. any further i'm like oh well that's the whole joystick it's just a different plug but yeah that's helpful i want to quickly kind of throw in just something i've been doing not in, so it's gaming but i get a lot of um, pc gamers i'm not sure how many everybody works with pc gamers but um for those low cervical injuries, C5, 6, 7s, um, I've been having a lot of success kind of working with them for uh, utilizing, usually it's uh, right hand will work out a good mousing method, uh, whether it's a trackball mouse. Sometimes I've kind of got them to be able to rest their hand on a, uh, a standard computer mouse with some kind of tacky, uh, essentially like a Dyson, but we have some nice like razor tackiness grip. Um, but in the, uh, the left hand, um, what I've actually been doing is I've developed the game pad myself that a lot of patients have been using. That's been really, really nice. Essentially a, a fight stick. <clears throat> it's like a fight stick, um, but in a form factor that is um, more conducive to somebody using it with one hand to be able to, typically it's that four-way joystick for WASD movement. And then, uh, a set of 10 buttons, um, easily accessible by, you know, shifting their hand and kind of hitting them combined with either like a joy to key or expat or software to map it out, um, to be able to play a lot of different games. And I've had a lot of great success with that. Um, I'm looking to try to get that game pad out to more people to be able to, to trial and use. But, um, if anybody's doing PC game, I'd like to hear maybe what they've tried aside from just like XAC on PC, if they have anything. And Jared, you mentioned a couple of things there and Drew posted that Etsy link. So we'll put all these links in the description too. Uh, and if you think of any more, just yeah, send them our way and we'll stick them in there. It's great to get exposure to all of these, these solutions that most people aren't even aware of. Mm -hmm. I think the, our, um, most frequently used for PC gaming has been quad stick. I don't know if it just happens to be that people that we've set up for PC games have been um, higher cervical injury uh, clients and gamers. And so I feel like for all of our PC setups, it's been mostly quad stick. Yeah, I do a ton. Of, I I love the quad stick. It's like my, that's my favorite adaptive gaming device by far. Um, Drew, I need to pick your brain and 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 about all the programming aspect of it. So yeah, I'm, it's I'm, like it's it's once it once uh I worked with a lot of people with like pretty high level injuries or like individuals like Duchenne's like kind of later mm -hmm. stages who don't have a lot of movement and um yeah my you can do some really cool things where I, I have a lot of people who play like really really competitively it's in the quad stick i guess since we're recording this is is a device where you're, i think i have one right here this is just for people when they watch the recording it's just a sip and puff uh and it's got three holes and you sip and puff for different controls and it's got one joystick and a lip switch but one of my favorite tricks for the quad stick and that not a lot of people do this but it has ports in the back and you can plug in adaptive switches to use alongside the quad stick you can plug in adaptive joysticks so if somebody has some hand movement, you can actually plug in an adaptive joystick and you can program it to be anything you want in the game. So like the PDP joysticks, any of the Warfighter engaged joysticks work with it. Um, I even have people, because um, the Quantic actually allows you to plug in a standard video game con controller, like a, a standard like PlayStation controller in the back of it, and it can pass through the controls. So you can use a standard controller alongside the sip and puff. So I have some people who can access maybe like a couple of the buttons on a standard controller and then I put the rest on the quad stick and it actually allows them to almost use it like co-pilot and play games or it also works if they have like a caregiver and let's say they get into a part of the game where they can't get through a caregiver can come and they can help with that part of the game but I mostly use it for like the, for the person to use as like a co-pilot type feature so it's got a lot of like really cool programming type features in it. Uh, Drew, I'm going to put you on the spotlight here, and can you just talk about the resources that you've posted, uh, both your uh, your website and YouTube, a little bit? Yeah, so uh, I guess it just I just released it earlier this year in uh, in January, but I 
had been working on uh, kind of putting together all of the resources for um, not only what's available for equipment, but how to set it up and how to program it. Um, so I have like a website that goes over kind of the most common adaptive controllers like the quad stick, Xbox adaptive controller, Hori Flex. Um, I'll have one for like the new PlayStation controller um, and one of my other favorite new controllers like the Azeron Cyro controller. Um, it goes over and it has videos on how to set them up, how to program them um, and how to like set them up on your specific consoles. And I also have different sections on how to set up, like let's say you have the Xbox adaptive controller we want to plan the Nintendo Switch, how to go through that process of setting up these adaptive controllers on different consoles. So, because um, I found there wasn't a lot of good resources out there um, on how to set up the equipment specifically. And it also has all the links I've kind of been talking about too, on where to purchase all this equipment, all like the attachments for it and all of those parts and where to look for those. Great, thanks Drew. Does anybody else have any additional resources that they utilize that they might want to share to uh, uh, the people who are listening tonight and also the people who will be listening later on on YouTube? If not, uh, please uh, just uh, post them later on, and uh, we do have uh, methods of doing that as well. Uh, so we're getting right up to... Uh, the eight o'clock time, I want to respect people's uh, time, but maybe we could just do a little bit of a round table of all our, all our engineers. And Jeff, if you don't mind too, what you feel is uh, the most important development at this point in time and what you'd like to see develop later on that's feasible within uh, the current uh, environment. And uh, Jeff, maybe I can start with you if you don't mind. Can I put you in the spot? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find is the things that have the most impact actually affect the or impact the most people. And the problem is everybody's different, right? So looking at things that actually open up accessibility to everyone uh, is always a fascinating concept. But I always think of like Siri, of how it was possibly designed for certain group and ends up being absolutely helpful to ridiculous amount of people uh, particularly if if you're in a wheelchair or be paralyzed or or it just in general just helps everyone so in a lot of these games there is so much flexibility that the key problem really is having development time to make it accessible to everyone you know it's the 80 20 rule right and unfortunately that means the 20 percent often get ignored but seeing more and more games coming to fruition that actually start incorporating by default voice controls, for example, for certain things, and and or uh, you start looking at some of these new controllers and things that are coming out, what could be really beneficial is to say, okay, if we put those in the hands of everyone, do people start using those instead of the Xbox controller? There are there key benefits to those things. Uh, and the more we can kind of make that whole field equitable, the, the one thing I always love about gaming in general, but and VR particularly, but gaming in general is it, you kind of don't have a disability when you're playing in those worlds, right? And that there's something beautiful about that and, and wonderful. And if we can get these devices more commonplace and more readily available to everyone to purchase, as well as more integrated into these experiences, then it's everybody's going to win. Great. Uh, can I throw it over to Mitch next? Yeah, I agree a lot with the games adding their own accessibility in. I just, I've been playing the new Forza Motorsport to test out. I have a patient who was a sim racer, just like me, used the wheel and racing games can be complex. You have gas, brakes, steering, ton of other things. And in the game now there's braking, gas, and steering assist levels, and you can do no assist, partial assist, or full assist. So on full assist, the car will drive itself around the track, and then using different adaptive switches, you can press the gas button to go faster, or press the brake to slow down quicker, or use the steering to adjust the car. And so even if a person can just use one button or one joystick, you can give them that control and then have the game handle the rest of it for them. 
and start working on those skills. Um, and Mario Kart has those options too. And it was added for grandparents and two and three year olds to play with the family and not get frustrated. Um, so it's really cool as I give these demonstrations to PTs and OTs that are in school right now and show some of the features and they say, I use that to play because I'm not a gamer. Um, but then they can see how that helps everyone else. Right. Seal, would you, would you like to comment? Yeah, so um, I think, I guess the technology that I'm, I'm kind of really excited to see, it's, it could be game related, but probably not. Um, the new Apple Vision Pro that's coming out, I, and I saw that um, the eye gaze or not, uh, the eye tracking on that is fantastic. It's next level and I'm not surprised. Um, with the current like state of the art, the kind of the top of the line eye gaze system that's used for communication devices, they have two IR cameras um, on the device, a Toby device that's connected that can integrate with an iPad has two IR cameras. The Vision Pro has four and also integrates the technology of putting an LED lit grid on the eyes that the device then can use to track the, the movements more accurately. There wasn't any sort of disclosure about if it, they didn't disclose any information about how that can be used for access. But as a you know, clinician, I'm like, that's, hey, like that could make things so much more accurate as far as using your eye movements. Um, but I think that from what I can tell, Apple's currently only using that to, um, track your engagement so if you're engaging with an icon that's what like kind of highlights and gets bigger um but i'm hoping that it would be opened up to developers to tap into to use as an access method uh, so that's what i'm kind of I'm waiting for that to launch i think it'll it comes out in march next year early next year i just um yeah i'm excited for that to come out so that i can verify and try to hack it you know and utilize it for our clients that's my hope as well. I hope that they uh, there's a there's a currently the the way I understand it is a combination of hand tracking, mm -hmm. voice, and uh, eye gaze, and I'm hoping that they can make it accessible and and yeah. maybe even adjust what you need to use accordingly. Right. Uh, keeper. Yeah. Let's let's hope for. I'm it. holding my breath though because I'm like either this will be like the most brilliant natural way for accessibility to like merge the mainstream tech world or it could be an utter disaster where like oh you guys are so close <laughs> but this is actually the most the least accessible device that's ever come out right so i'm like holding my breath like which way will it go <laughs> yeah. yeah awesome drew yeah so i guess the technology uh one recent adaptable that i was really excited about that just came out recently was uh the azeron syro um I don't have a it right on me or a picture of it, but it's a really good option for someone with one hand. Um, it, it's a really kind of slick design that allows someone who uses like one hand for gaming to pretty, a game at a pretty high level using the device. And I think it's better than a lot of the other one-handed controllers that were out previously. Um, and then kind of going for the future, I mean, the big thing, my big thing and my big kind of um, problem with a lot of the gaming systems and everything is just universal accessibility is, being able to plug in any single device into any console and be able to just play. So I think that's just a big barrier and it, it adds a lot of cost to individuals with disabilities having to purchase additional pieces to play on the console that they wanna play on. Uh, it's, and I think one of the big things a lot of these consoles do is they shut down a lot of these things because it's looked at as cheating. Even though a lot of these people rely on having these things and for them, it's not cheating. It's just allowing them to play games. So just being able to plug their device in and use the device they need to play in order to play the game is a big thing. And then also, like I said, on the software side of things, a lot of these companies don't allow you to build in certain things like macros and certain things that some gamers use for cheating, but other gamers, um, like individuals with disabilities, use these adaptive controllers. We program those things in like macros and different tips, different tricks in there not for cheating, just to allow them to complete the game. So I think that kind of needs to be worked out for the consoles uh, going forward. And I really want to see that in the future um, for like gaming accessibility. Great. And Jared. Yeah, so I think um, 
I kind of want to piggyback off of a bit what Jeff and Song he had said, you know, the that kind of like spillover effect of mainstream tech being developed and how it has that uh, that ability to not to be intended, but is extremely useful for individuals with disabilities, I think is what we're going to find to be really beneficial. Um, for I mean, and going off of, you know, the, the Apple Vision Pro, I mean, I know Apple's always been really great with accessibility on the iPhone and Mac. And so I could imagine, again, right now it's all developer focused. They made the hardware, developers are doing the software. I can't imagine it'd be that hard to add in some sort of a dwell function or something with that eye tracking. And then that and voice and you can give somebody with, you know, a C3 injury, almost a full computer on their head to do all their work. But, you know, I see a lot of benefits of advent of AI really providing a huge amount of input for our, our uh, you know, the disability population in a lot of areas. Um, but, you, you know, you see development improving eye tracking for these devices is going to drive down the cost of eye tracking and improve its uh, um you know, the quality of it. And then we're going to see, you know, high, high uh, fidelity eye tracking and cheaper devices. And then, you know, maybe Toby can pick up some technology um, and then you know, looking at how we can utilize AI for uh, computer control. I know that a lot of, you know, being able to interact with technology using natural language is going to be a huge thing that I don't think people are really thinking about, but, you know, you look at Dragon software, you know, Dragon is like the standard for access for computers and it works well, but you still are, are restricted to very specific commands to get it to do what you want. And so once we're all able to be able to just talk to our technology and say, do this, do that, it's going to make you know, the barrier to entry as well for patients who maybe aren't as tech savvy, but now rely on that tech as that kind of middle ground, make it a lot easier. So I think that's the most exciting thing that I've been kind of looking into in the coming years. Great. So I want to uh, thank everybody for uh, sharing their ideas, their thoughts, and uh, hopefully we can do this again. Uh, we will definitely regroup in about, oh, four, three, four months, Jeff, uh, with another uh, set of uh, topics and so forth. And and uh, hopefully uh, for those of you that haven't met each other, that will uh, create new bonds and some uh, and hopefully share some new ideas as well. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything to add before we close? Uh, the only thing I'd say is, you know, we try and do these quarterly, but sometimes we do them monthly. It really depends on what the needs are. Uh, as Christmas is around the corner, it's an interesting time to try and give people time to do anything. But at the same time, it's also that time of sharing, right? So if anybody out there does think of a, a good topic that, that fits the season well, you know, let us know. Let's see if we can put it on the schedule. And hopefully we'll uh, get this posted. And uh, please, if you have uh, some peers or somebody else that might be interested in the information we talked about, please share it. Yeah. There's one more thing, actually, Randy. Uh, some of our, our members here actually have their own podcasts and YouTube channels, and um, th they're often a benefit to everybody else out there, too. So if, if you guys want to chat briefly, just to wrap up, like a couple of minutes on, on the stuff that you're doing there, because we want to support you in those endeavors, too. Part of my background in gaming has been doing YouTube gaming videos and streams for five, six, or seven years with my friend. Um, but through that, we've worked with Ubisoft, um, giving them feedback on a lot of their games, mostly Steep and Riders Republic. So I can tend to do some testing and tell them some accessibility ideas on what they add. Um, and then, you know, just doing YouTube for so long, we really try to focus on making those videos accessible as possible. So in like premiere when i'm editing it can do an automatic transcription based on your audio tracks and label who is the speaker so that's something before i upload every video i make sure there's a transcript that it's good and that the captions are ready to be posted in that um you know i try to keep those accessibility things in mind too so i don't have a lot of flashing things or a lot of stuff moving around on the screen that can be um custom problems for people can you actually give the name of it? We'll put the description there too, but I want to make sure if someone does the transcript of this, they they get it. Yep. It's Nick and Mitch on YouTube. So I think youtube.com slash Nick and Mitch. 
Um, the one other feature we use, uh, live streaming, you can enable automatic live captioning through YouTube. Um, you have to have a bit more of a delay on your stream. I think it's around 30 seconds from live. So reacting in comments is a little bit slower, but I know our racing videos we do, we have two drivers who watch who are deaf. And so after the first race, they said, hey, we love the video, but could you add captions? So we made sure to enable that. And now that's the standard. Awesome. Andrew, why don't you just give a recap of yours too? Because I don't think you you sold it in now for at least you know, give us the title and a, just a quick overview. Yeah, so uh, I have a it's a website gamingreadapted.com, and then there's an associated YouTube channel, Gaming Readapted, um, and the YouTube channel just kind of serves as the place where all the videos are held for going over like the some new controllers, some new um, technology for like setting up the different controllers. Um, different ways and programming and setting up different adaptive controllers. And then the the website kind of serves as the site that shows where to get the controllers or to purchase all the components. And then it kind of has all the videos embedded in it as well. So it's a really good all in one source for kind of going over all of the uh, main adaptive gaming equipment that's available here um, today. I think there's another organization that uh, a few of us use quite extensively that we should plug a little bit to, and that's Able Gamers. Um, I know Jared uses it, Mitch uses it. Uh, Siong, do you, yeah. Uh, does anybody want to take that on and just sort of describe what they're doing for us and how maybe we could sort of come together as a group and make that organization stronger as well? I'd be happy to kind of talk a little bit. So I've you know, formed a partnership with Able Gamers. Um, you know, their initiative is combating social isolation and just supporting all individuals uh, with any disability to get back into gaming. Um, they're, I think the, the struggle that they have had and why they've made a huge effort to partner with a lot of physical facilities across the country is that, you know, they're small uh nonprofit organization, but do primarily all of their kind of work virtually. So they have a great system and very knowledgeable people and resources to provide the equipment to all the patients and individuals who come to them, but they're limited in basically video calls like this to do their kind of determination of need. And it can be really tough to figure out what's going to work. So, you know, the Shepherd Center, we've partnered with Able Gamers and have a great system now where, you know, we will do a lot of that equipment setup, determination, we'll submit referral ticket to Able Gamers. Oftentimes we'll get one of their guys on call with us um, to kind of work through that process. But, you know, we're able to do that hands-on setup, figure out what's going to work really well for that patient, and then kind of do a handoff with all that information over to Able Gamers. And then they're able to kind of follow them after inpatient discharge and continue to work with them, get them that equipment and make sure they can get set up with it. Um, so they've been really, you know, appreciative of us being able to do that kind of more of the hands-on stuff. And we've been really appreciative too, because, you know, being primarily inpatient focused at Shepherd, we do a lot with the patients, but after they discharge, you know, we're consumed by new patients and it's hard to continue to follow up with all of those patients as they've moved on. And so having able gamers kind of pick that patient up and help them along the way, it, it it's kind of a nice uh, way to have those patients still get the support that they need um, uh, carried on throughout their life uh, you know, without us having to try to continue that support or not be able to. Great. Thanks, Jared. And once again, thanks to everybody for agreeing to do this. This, this was awesome. Yeah.